Alright, so in the previous lecture we have already seen uh, a PN junction and we finished our lecture at this point. We have a P type crystal that is grown into an N type crystal, there is a junction. There is a region outside the junction. Excuse me. All right. There is a region outside the junction that is called the depletion layer. region predominantly has free electrons which are mobile charge carriers and it has a large majority of them. The P type region has holes which are the majority charge carriers inside the holes. The junction has been made because of interdiffusion of the holes and the electrons across the junction just because of the concentration gradient. As a result, this region has become depleted of negatively charged electrons, so it requires a positive charge. This region has become depleted of positively charged holes, so it requires a negative charge. Electron or recombination has taken place inside this region. Therefore, this region is devoid of any charges, of any charge carriers. So it's neutral. But there is, so sorry, it does not have any mobile charge carriers. All right, because the electrons and holes have recombined. There exists, there exists a strong electric field inside this region, and the direction of this electric field is shown by this yellow arrow. So this is an electric field E. J that points from the N type region to the P type region. <coughs> All right. So this is where we finished off our previous lecture and we also noticed that there were small negative charges here and small positive charges here and these charges were made because of the fringe field and they caused, uh, they co they caused electrons for this region to become slightly devoid of positive holes, so it acquired a negative charge, and this region became slightly devoid of mobile negative charge carriers and acquired a positive charge. But these charges are really small that are developed on the surface, and they arise because of the fringe field. Inside this region, the electric field is zero. Inside this region, the electric field is zero, and there exists a strong electric field inside the depletion layer, but it does not have any mobile charge carriers. So this is where we finish off our previous lecture. Now what I was interested in asking is what's the magnitude of this electric field? How large is this electric field? And is the electric field uniform inside this region? Has there been any brave soul who's attempted to find out what this electric field looks like? Sorry? Did you derive this relationship? All right. Your answer is correct, but you need a formal derivation for this. So let's use Gauss's law to find out what the electric field inside this region actually is. All right. Suppose I define an axis, the x-axis. This point is 0. The width of this depletion layer is d and the junction is made at d by 2. I would like to find out what the electric field looks like inside this region. So let me zoom in on, on this region. So I draw the depletion layer. This is x equals 0. This is x equals d. Here I have negative charges. Here I have positive charges. Suppose the 
volume charge density is rho. That is, I have rho negative charges per unit volume inside this region and rho positive charges per unit volume inside this region. And this volume charge density is uniform because the electrons and the holes have recombined inside this region to give us a depleted region. And that depleted region is of course charged because previously there were negatively charged electrons here in, X, in excess and they disappeared. So this region requires a positive charge. Here, the holes have disappeared. So this region requires a negative charge. And the charge that has disappeared is the same as the charge carry density throughout the p-type region and it's the same as the charge carry density inside the n-type region. The only difference is that this is negative and this is positive. All right. Now we would like to find out the electric field. That's quite easy. We will use Gauss's law. So let's draw a Gaussian surface, a cylinder that has one of its ends poking inside the depletion region. Now the electric field inside this region is zero. But there is some electric field in here. Let's call that electric field E. All right. We would like to find out what this electric field is. Suppose this point is at a distance x. This end cap of the Gaussian surface is at a distance x poking inside the depletion region. And suppose the cross-sectional area of this Gaussian cylinder is A. Now, the left-hand side of the Gauss's law tells us, for first of all, let's look at what happens when x is greater than 0 and less than d by 2. So it's in the left half of the depletion region. From the Gauss's law's left-hand side, we have E times A. The electric field is pointing to the left and the area of F is pointing to the right. So minus E A equals 1 over epsilon naught, the charge that is enclosed inside this region only because everything else here is neutral. Remember, even though I've drawn positively charged holes here, this region is neutral. This does not mean that this region is positively charged. It just has an excess of positively charged mobile carriers. But this region is neutral, this region is neutral. It's only that this depletion region has acquired a charge. It's non-neutral. So there is only charge within this region. And how much is that charge? That is equal to minus rho, which is the charge density to the volume of this region. And the volume of this region is A times x. So this A goes away. This minus sign goes away. The electric field, which is a function of x, equals rho x over epsilon naught. inside this first half of the region. So it varies linearly as x. So if I were to plot the electric field inside this region, the electric field is increasing linearly up to d by 2, up to half of the depletion region. So this is how the electric field is varying inside this depletion region. It's non-constant. Remember, this is not a thin sheet of charge. Rather, charge has been distributed over a volume. Here, charge is distributed over a volume. So it's not a thin sheet of charge and vacuum in between. This material in here and the entire material has been charged because of the depletion of charge carriers. Likewise, let's find what happens when x is greater than d by 2 and less than d. Could you use Gauss's law to find out what happens in this scenario? In this scenario, we would like to draw a Gaussian surface that has one end inside the neutral region and the other end poking inside the depletion region but the positive side of the depletion region. All right? So what I would like you to find out, if this is x, what is the electric field inside this region? Now use Gauss's law and find out the electric field, please.
So I'm pleased to know that quite a few students have actually found this out. So for this region, what we have is, now the electric field is pointing in this direction. The area vector is pointing outwards. I have minus Ea equals 1 over epsilon naught times the charge enclosed. Now the charge enclosed is given by minus rho A d by 2. This is the negative charge enclosed plus rho A and what's this distance? This distance is x minus d by 2. x minus d by 2. So I opt the A goes away I have E equals, okay, minus E equals my, uh, rho over epsilon naught minus V by 2 plus X minus V by 2. So, E equals minus E equals rho by epsilon naught x minus d. E equals rho over epsilon naught d minus x. <laughs> so now what I've actually done is I found out the electric field inside the entire depletion region. And if I plot this electric field, it's a downward sloping electric field because there's a minus sign here. This electric field starts at this point, it downward slopes and comes down to zero. If I put x equals d, the electric field turns out to be zero. If I put x equals d half, this gives me rho d over 2 epsilon naught, which is the same as the electric field here. So the electric field just changes its direction at this point. It changes its slope. In other words, the electric field inside this region is zero, the electric field inside this region is zero. So this is how the electric field looks like. It goes up and it comes down. So the electric field is triangular shape and the electric field can be discontinuous here. Now, this is the electric field. The electric field at this point equals rho d over 2 epsilon naught. This is the maximum electric field that exists inside the depletion region. Now, we would like to find out how large is this electric field. For that, we need to know what is rho, the charge carrier density. 
and we can do a rough calculation for that purpose. I gave you some numerical figures at the end of the previous lecture. We need to find out typically how large is this depletion region. Is it one nanometers? Is it 100 nanometers? Is it one millimeter? Is it one centimeters? What, what are typical values of this junction, uh, the, the width of this depletion region? But now we have a profile of the electric field. Since we have a profile of the electric field, we can actually find out how does the potential vary inside this region. Because we know that the potential and the electric field are related. So let's find out the potential inside the depletion region as we go from the left to the right. Now there is no electric field in here, so the electric field is constant, albeit at zero. Here there is no electric field, so it's constant. So the potential does not change inside this region and inside this region. But the potential would indeed change inside the depletion region because the electric field is not constant. The potential will be the integral of this electric field. So if this is linear, the potential has to be parabolic. All right. So let's find out what the potential is. Let's do a calculation to find out what the potential is. So for x greater than 0 and less than d by 2, that is, we are inside the left half of the depletion region towards the p side, the potential <coughs> Vx at some point x inside this region, some point x in here is minus the potential here, which is 0. So Vx minus 0 is delta V equals minus E dotted with dl. So instead of dl, I'm writing dx. Okay? It's the same thing. So this is how we define the change in the potential. So Vx minus 0, which is a change in the potential, is equal to this. Now the electric field is pointing to the left and we are moving towards the right. So this dot product is negative. And the negative uh, catches up with this negative sign to give you a positive sign. So I'm left off with, and the electric field inside this region is given by this, rho x over epsilon naught. So I have plus rho over epsilon naught x dx where I go from 0 to some point x. So this is the potential at point x inside the left side of the depletion region. And this turns out to be rho x squared over 2 epsilon naught. Of course, as I am going towards the positive side, as I am going from this side towards the positive side, the potential is going up because I'm moving towards the positive charge. So the potential has to go up. That's why this is a positive number. So in this region, the potential is going up. So if I were to plot the electric field and the potential together, this is what the plot would look like. X, this is 0, this is D, X, here I'm plotting E as a function of X and here I'm plotting V as a function of X. The electric field goes up, reaches a maximum value and then drops down linearly. Whereas the potential inside this region increases like a parabola. It goes up like this. And this potential here is rho d squared by 8 epsilon naught because I just insert x equals d by 2 here. So I found out the potential inside this region. Now I need to find out the potential inside this region. And I'm assuming that the potential here is everywhere 0 because the potential cannot change discontinuously. It has to be continuous. <coughs> All of this region is an isopotential volume. So now what I would like to do, I would like to find out the potential in the right side of the, of the depletion region. I would like to find out the potential here. 
I know what the electric field here is. So I will integrate this to find out the potential in the right side of the depletion region. So what I would like to do is for x greater than d by 2 and less than d, what I do have is the potential at some x minus the potential at this edge, right? The potential at this edge minus rho d square over 8 epsilon naught. This is the change in potential and this is defined as minus e as I go from d by 2 to some x, right? Now my starting point is this. Okay, so what I've done here, the change in potential as I move onwards from this point is the potential at some distance x minus the potential at my starting point, which is this point. So this is this potential equals minus the lower limit now becomes this starting point. And my final position is x. And what's the electric field inside this region? It's given by this. So I have rho epsilon naught d minus x dx. So this gives me the potential at point x. I can integrate this. So if I were to integrate this, the result that I would obtain, I can take this to the right hand side and the result that I would obtain is a it's some algebra. I do not want to spend time because I'm short of time. <coughs> this result gives me minus rho d square over 4 epsilon naught plus rho x over epsilon naught d minus x by 2. G. Which one is negative? Sorry, how did this positive get made? This? It was like this, that it was negative, but the electric field is pointing to the left, but my x is increasing towards the right direction. So this dot product is negative. That's why I get a positive sign. So this is the potential at some point x. Again, you will notice, this is a constant, this is a quadratic term x squared, so it's also quadratic, it's a parabolic change. And if I were to extend this inside this region, the parabola will look like this. So this is how the potential changes inside this region. And outside this region, the potential once again becomes constant. Now this simple step is something for you to do on your own. It's a do-it-yourself step. It's quite easy to perform this integration. If x equals d, I would like to find out what this change in potential is across the depletion region. That will give me a delta v. The voltage across the junction, the change in the potential across the junction will be equal to this height. And how can I find this change in potential? I just put x equals to d inside here. If I were to put x equals d, I would obtain v at d equals minus rho d square over 4 epsilon naught plus rho d square over epsilon naught minus rho d square over 2 epsilon naught. So what I have is 1 minus half minus 1 by 4. So I have 1 by 4. So this is rho d square over 4 epsilon naught. This is my potential difference across the junction. Alright? This is the potential difference across the junction. So just by having a crystal which is p-type evolve into an n-type crystal, and I do it continuously, a junction is created, a depletion region is created across the junction, 
and there's a certain voltage that is developed, all by the process of diffusion and by the process of negative feedback. This negative feedback creates a voltage which is given by this. It of course depends upon the char ch uh, charge carry density and the width of the depletion region. Now let's find out this width. Let's make an estimate of this width. If this material out of which I'm making the PN junction diode is silicon, then this potential is roughly 1.1 electron volts. 1.1 volts, sorry. It's voltage, so it's 1.1 volts for silicon. For germanium, it's generally 0.7 volts. These are typical values. So let's find out what sh should this D be actually equal to. All right? We're going to do a rough calculation here. <clears throat> and we're going to do the calculation for silicon. So silicon has a density of 2.4 grams per cubic centimeter. Its molecular weight is 28 grams per mole. So what we have here is we would like to find out how many atoms exist of silicon per cubic centimeters. So if I have 6 into 10 is about 23 atoms, then the mass of this number of atoms will be 28 grams. But what's the volume of this? The volume of this will be 28 divided by 2.4 cubic centimeters, right? So I assume that this is just 2.8. So I get 10 cubic centimeters. I'm doing a rough calculation here. I don't want to use a calculator. So this many atoms has this has this much volume. So one cubic centimeter will have 6 into 10 is per 22 atoms. One cubic meter would have 6 into 10 is per 28 atoms. Now for each silicon atom, I'm doping either an n-type impurity or a p-type impurity. Which means that what I'm trying to do is for every 10 is per 5 silicon atoms, I have one impurity atom, which I'm deliberately putting inside the crystal to make it an n-type or a p-type. Okay? So this, these are typical doping levels in a, in a p-n junction. Which means that my the number of charge carriers per unit volume. Now, silicons atoms by themselves are not giving you mobile charge carriers. It's the dopants that are giving you the charge carriers. So, the number of charge carriers is about 6 into 10 is part 23 per cubic meter. And if I were to multiply this by 1.6 into 10 is part minus 90, I would get rho per cubic meter. Let's call this 10 raised to power 24 minus 19. Uh, this is 1.6. 23 minus 19 is minus 4. Let's call this minus 3 to per cubic meter. All right, I'm doing a rough calculation here, by the way. So this is my charge carrier density. Inside the depletion region, the amount of charge that I have per unit volume is, is this much. Coulomb per meter cube. This is the amount of charge that I have in a unit volume inside the depletion region. Because here the electrons and moles have recombined to give me a depleted region. And the amount of depletion that I get is the amount of charge carriers that were initially present per unit volume. So this is the amount of rho inside the depletion region. Now I can use this value of rho in here to find out what d square is. My d square is roughly 4 epsilon naught into 1 volt divided by rho. <coughs> Now, let's find out d squares. This is 4 
Now this is 8.85 into 10 to the power minus 12, which is 10 into 10 to the power minus 12 roughly. But since we're not dealing with vacuum here, we have a material like silicon. Silicon will not have an epsilon. It will have some relative permittivity being multiplied by this dielectric constant, and we'll learn more about this. So it's not vacuum. So I just multiply this with the relative permittivity of silicon, which is about 10 into 1 divided by 10 to the power minus 3. So if you look at Rho is plus 3, sorry. Alright, so this turns out to be 10 to the power minus 10, 10 raised to the power minus 10, 10 raised to the power minus uh, 10, 10 raised to the power minus 13, roughly. So let's make it 10 to the power minus 14, just for sake of for, for ease. Okay, so d square is 10 to the minus 14 meter square, which means that d is roughly 10 to the minus 7 meters, which is about 100 to 1000 <laughs> atomic units or angstroms. So this depletion region, if you take one angstrom as a typical size of an atom, is only about 100 to 1000 atoms wide which is a really small number. So this depletion region is extremely small, maybe 100 atoms across, maybe 200 atoms across, maybe 1000 atoms across, but it's really, really small. Remember, one gram or say 28 grams of silicon is 10 to the power 23 atoms. But these are just hundreds of atoms that we're talking about. So this depletion region is extremely small, but the real action takes place inside this extremely thin depletion region. It's only some atomic units wide. Now we found out typical values of D. 100 angstroms, 200 angstroms, and so on. Now we can also find out what the typical value of the electric field here is. So if I were to find out, put plug in these values and find out the typical value for the electric field, EN. This EM would be really large, by the way. It's going to be rho, which is 10 is part 3, <clears throat> D, which is, say, 100 angstroms. 100 into 10 is part minus 10, divided by 2 times 10 into 10 into 10 is part minus 12. So this electric field is about 10 raised to power 5 minus 10 minus 1 minus 1 plus 12, right, roughly. This is about 17 manfi bara, 10 raised to power 5. So this is the relative permittivity of silicon. Epsilon R. This is 8.85 newton over minus 12. So this turns out to be 10,000 volts per meter. It's an extremely large field inside the junction. Remember that the breakdown strength of air is 50,000 volts per centimeter, 50 kilovolts per centimeter, which is 50. Five, uh, 50 kilovolts into 10 power 3 into 10 power 5 volts per meter. And here we have 10 raised power 5 volts per meter inside silicon. It's a really large field. But remember that the breakdown strength of silicon is much larger than air. It's not air that we're talking about. But the take home message is that this simple fusion of a P type crystal with an N type crystal creates enormous electric fields inside the PN junction. So you buy a 1 to P PN junction diode, 
just on its own, there's a 1.1 volt potential difference across this junction, which is only a few hundred atoms wide, and the electric field that exists inside this junction is thousands of volts per meter. Huge electric field. See the power of physics, the power of simple concepts. See how many surprises are there out there for you to explore just to stumble upon you, you have to look at them and stare in the face of these surprises. You can't just ignore them. Now, how does this potential difference help us in the operation of a PN junction? All right, so let's see how does the PN junction actually make use of this strong electric field. This is X and what I'm going to plot here is the potential energy as a function of X. Now I've already drawn the potential as a function of X. So the potential energy is simply E times Vx where E is the charge on, an, on a charge carrier which is an electron or a hole and conventionally we take our test charges to be positive. So the potential energy profile inside this material would look like this. This is D. This is D by 2. Here we have the N type region, right? This is N and here we have the P type region. And this is the junction. This region is the junction here. This is the junction. So this is the potential energy of a positive test charge. Right? For, for a potential energy, you need to have a test charge. This is the potential energy of a positive test charge that is placed within this field configuration, within this configuration of charges. This is how the potential energy looks like. All right? So the potential energy is higher here. The potential energy is lower here. Now if I were to plot the potential energy of an electron, the potential energy of an electron inside the same region, it's just going to be minus EVX. So it's just going to be, I can take my reference to be anywhere. So it's just going to drop. The potential is rising for a positive test charge, but for a negative charge, it's going, just going to be the inverse. So I will have a potential here, it's going to draw parab parabolically like this. This is D, this is X equals 0, this is my X axis. And here I have the N type material and here I have the B type material. So this is the potential energy of an electron that is placed inside a PN junction. If it's placed inside the p-type material, it will have a higher potential. If it's placed inside the n-type material, it will have a lower potential as far as the junction is concerned. All right? And here the potential energy is going downhill. All right? Now, but this is the situation in equilibrium. All right, this is the equilibrium situation after all the diffusion has taken place and the charges have settled down and everything is in equilibrium. There is no flow of charge now. All right, now you have to follow my argument really carefully because it's a systematic methodical argument that I'm going to present now. <clears throat> is equilibrium established. You will not learn this in your circuit analysis class. Remember this. What you will learn in your circuit analysis is something like this. You will say you will have some, this is what you will learn. 
But what we're learning here is the underlying physics of a VN junction. If you understand this, you can understand how a transistor works. You can understand how a PNP, NPN, a bipolar, a MOSFET, how a JFET works. So it's important to understand the underlying physics of the most innocent of these semiconductor devices, which is a diode. So how is equilibrium established? Before we reach this equilibrium situation, what do we have? Conventional direction is that the current is flowing in the opposite direction. 
Let's denote this current by this arrow and let's call it the recombination current, IR. Because what happens is once the electrons have sufficient kinetic energy, they've crossed the barrier, they've gone into the p-type region. And remember, in the p-type region, these electrons are unwelcome because the p is a whole rich region. And the electrons are not the majority carriers there. So it's an unwelcome entity inside this region. It recombines immediately with the hole and emits energy. And the overall energy of the system lowers. And it this flow of electrons constitutes a current in this direction because conventional current is in the opposite direction to the flow of electrons. It's called the recombination current. <clears throat> but this is before equilibrium has established. On the other hand, on the other hand, what an alternative process can also happen. In the p-type region, in this p-type region, the majority charge carriers are holes. But there's nothing stopping you from electron hole generation, thermally generated electron holes. The temperature is large, so electrons and holes can be thermally generated. So what can happen here is inside this p-type region, a new negatively charged free electron can pop up and create a corresponding hole, right? Because of an electron jumping from the conduction valence band to the conduction band, it creates a hole. And temperature assists this process. This is called electron hole generation, as we've seen in the previous lecture. Here, likewise, this electron, a hole can appear. In this region, a hole can appear because an electron has been thermally generated. Electron hole generation, thermally assisted electron hole generation can take place here and it can take place here. And it only depends upon temperature. In this region, electrons and holes can also be created by the thermal generation. So suppose that an electron, this electron, which is a minority inside this p-type region, which has been created thermally, wanders off into this region. And when it wanders off into this region, the electric field inside the junction assists its motion to the n-type region. So an electron that has been created here in the unfriendly region, in the hostile region, if it wanders off into the junction, it is assisted by this electric field and it can go towards the n-type region. Likewise, a hole that has been generated here, if it wanders off into this region, it will be assisted by this electric field and it will go towards the p-type region. So these thermally generated electron hole pairs can be accelerated by the electric field and the electric field is in the proper direction for these minority carriers. In other words, let's look at the potential diagram here. <coughs> Suppose in this region, it's a p-type region, so it has more holes. However, by the process of thermal generation, an electron can be created here, right? Which means energy comes in, energy comes in, thermal generation means some energy has to come in, and it's coming from KBT, from the temperature. So energy comes in, a hole is created, and a corresponding electron is created, now this electron can lower its energy by falling downhill. And when it lowers its energy by rolling downhill, it comes here. But the amount of energy that it has lowered, the amount of energy that it has lowered is smaller than the amount of energy it had, it has gained. So in this process, there is net gain of energy. And it's an unwelcome process. However, if electrons float from the p-type to the n-type, they will also constitute a current. And the conventional direction of this current is in the opposite direction. And this current is called the thermally generated current, Tg. The thermal current or the thermally generated current.
So there's a recombination current and there's a thermally generated current. Why is the thermally generated current smaller? Because this process picks up energy. This process devours energy. This process eats up energy. Whereas this process releases energy. This process lowers the energy of the system, whereas this process increases the energy of the system. So this thermally generated current is smaller. And this recombination current is larger. And when this recombination current is larger, it means that more electrons are going from the N type to the P type. More electrons are going from the N type to the P type. And when more electrons are going from the N type to the P type, this becomes more and more positive charge. This requires a higher positive charge. This region requires a higher positive charge because it's depleted of electrons. When it requires a higher positive charge, the electric field increases. And when the electric field increases, this potential gap, this potential barrier drops. Drops like this. Because the electric field has gone up. This side has become more positive because it is quickly release, releasing its electron. It, electrons are rushing out from this region. And therefore, this acquires a positive charge. When this acquires a positive charge, this acquires a bigger negative charge, the electric field goes up. When the electric field goes up, the potential difference goes up. So the potential difference between this side and this side increases, which means that if I were to pick, fix this, I would have to lower this side of the potential well. Eventually, what I will obtain is a potential barrier, just like what I've drawn over there in the equilibrium situation. In this condition, what I have is the amount of kinetic energy an electron has to gain in order to move to the p-type region is the same as the amount of energy that is released in a recombination process. So the recombination current and the thermally generated current become equal in strength and there is no net flow of charge and an equilibrium is established. So this gap must be equal to the band gap energy because this is the dif difference between the valence band and the conduction band. So this energy is indeed 1.1 electron volts and this gap is 1.1 volts. So this is how equilibrium is established. And in a state of equilibrium, this current remains fixed because the temperature is fixed. Nothing happens to the thermally generated current. Only the recombination current drops. As this potential comes down, it becomes more and more difficult for these electrons to pick up enough kinetic energy to go to the other side because the gap has gone up. And in equilibrium, this ITG becomes equal to IR. And this is when the junction capacitance is set up, the junction voltage is set up, that voltage is 1.1 volts for silicon, the electric field of thousands of volts per meter is set up and equilibrium is established. Now I, have, I would like to have one minute of silence here before I go on to forward bias and reverse bias in this device. Suppose I have a PN junction, P, N, there's an electric field in here and of course there's a potential step, right? Now I'm drawing Vx here, this is a plot of Vx. The potential increases from the P side to the N side. Now this is a PN junction standing on its own, in its entirety. Now what I would like to ask 
is whether this PN junction supposedly looks like a battery because there's an electric field here, there's a potential chain, that's what happens inside a battery. Can I use this battery, so-called battery, to drive a current through a circuit? That's the question. If I had this PN junction just out of diffusion, that I have a voltage source and can drive a current perpetually. Let's see if that can take place. Now, what I would like to do, I would like to hypothetically take this P-type material and extrude it, which means I would like to uh, extend it and so that this P-type material just com comes back here so that I have a closed circuit. Right? I would like to make a closed circuit for a current to flow. So what I would like to do, I would take this P-type material and just extrude it. I'm using this word extrude. I can't find a better word for this. I just extend it so that it makes a closed loop and goes back to this n-type continuum. Now, can a current flow through this device perpetually? That's not possible. The energy has to be conserved, which means that the change in the potential energy, a positive or a negative charge, sees around this closed path has to be zero because that is Faraday's law. E dotted with dl across a closed path must be zero if there are no changing magnetic fields. So this is Faraday's law, partial form of it nevertheless. But what, what's going to happen here is that at this side of the material, another junction is going to be created. And the n-type, there's an n-type material here, there's an n-type, p-type material here. So a depletion region, only a few atoms wide, will be created here, just like we have a depletion region here. And a potential step is going to develop. And in equilibrium, if this goes up by a certain amount, this must come down by a certain amount, so that the total change in potential across this circuit is zero. And when equilibrium is established, no doubt initially some charges might flow because of diffusion and to equilibrate the entire process, so that this potential is developed here. But nevertheless, in equilibrium, no current is going to flow through the circuit. In other words, the potential here is constant. It's an isopotential volume, therefore no electric field can exist here, which means that no charges can flow inside this region because there's zero electric field inside this so-called P-type conductor. Likewise, we can have a metal wire that is soldered at this point and a metal wire that is soldered at this point, we can have a depletion region between a metal and a P-type material, a depletion region between an N-type material and a P-type material. Such a junction is called a short key junction. So there are depletion regions whenever semiconductors mate with metals. Now let's see how does a PN junction operate when it is itself connected to a battery. Right? <laughs> we would like to use this as a diode and we would like to see what is the characteristic curve of a diode. From the knowledge of physics that we have developed so far, we can motivate the characteristic curve of a diode. of charges, 
right? Two plates, say, of opposite charges. Now, this positive, now this is a conductor. So this positive charge here, there's no positive charge here, so there's an electric field and charges will flow. Eventually, this conductor would try to approach an equipotential volume because it's a conductor. So there is no electric field here. But nevertheless, there is some positive charge here. And there are electrons. The, there are mobile electrons here. They are in majority here. No doubt there will be holes as well, but the electrons are in majority. So what this positive charge here would do is would attract this sea of electrons. These mobile electrons are a sea of electrons. Likewise, what's going to happen is that this entire C will slightly nudge towards the right. And when it nudges towards the right, it will create a depletion of negative charge here. So this junction barrier, this iron curtain between the junction and the semiconductor is going to extend towards the right a little bit. So instead of this being the junction, this is slightly going to go into this direction and positive charges will be created here. So this junction is going to increase in its width. Likewise, this is getting a negative charge. This will pull the holes towards itself, which will create slightly excess negative charge in this region. In other words, this junction is going to dilate a little bit. It's going to expand a little bit. Now, when this is going to expand a little bit, D is going to go up a little bit maybe a few atoms, few tens of atoms, but it's going to go up. The electric field is going to go up. The electric field, once again, is pointing in this direction, and it depends upon D. The potential difference between these sides is going to go up. So in equilibrium, what we had is the following scenario. In equilibrium, for the electron, this was the potential energy barrier. This is the, remember, this is the n type medium. This is an equilibrium. In equilibrium, I R, which is in this direction, is the same as the thermally generated electrons, which is in this direction. I R, remember, is due to the majority charge carriers, that is, the mobile electrons here that have enough kinetic energy to cross this barrier, but when they cross this barrier, come here, they combine with the hole to release energy. This is the recombination current. The thermally generated current is electrons that can be created in the p-type region are in the proper direction for the electric field so that they can just whimsically pass through this junction and go into the n-type region. So this is the thermally generated current. In equilibrium, both of these are equal. Now what we have, we have reverse bias this diode. So this potential difference goes up. So when the potential difference goes up, here the potential difference is at its reference level. It goes up like this. So now the potential difference, the potential barrier was like this. Now it has gone further down. So any electron that's initially here finds it more difficult to go to the p-type material because it has to increase its kinetic energy by a larger amount. So IR drops. IR drops. Because IR is due to negatively charged electrons, which are majority carriers here, having enough kinetic energy so that they can go uphill. But now this energy gap has increased. We have to pass a higher mountain. Okay? Now when this recombination current has gone down, what's going to happen to the thermally generated carriers? Nothing. The thermal motion of the electrons and the hole is still the same. The temperature is still the same. So this thermally generated current is still going to be the same but it's a very small current. So what's going to happen is that there could be a slight leakage of current, thermally generated electrons, that is electron holes that are created, for example, in this region or inside this region. 
the electrons that are created inside this region, which is the p-type region, can flow downhill. And they can flow downhill across this gap. But the amount of electrons that are available for flowing downhill is just dependent upon the temperature, because these are created by temperature. So nothing happens to the thermally generated current. However, the recombination current has dropped. A very minute thermally generated current will actually flow through this circuit. ITG minus IR will flow through the circuit. And the direction of that current <coughs> is the direction of the conventional current is just going to be. So, what's going to happen is that the electrons will flow in this direction. Uh, the electrons are created here. Electrons come here and they're attracted here. So the thermally generated current is flowing in this direction. So I've plotted these in the wrong direction. Sorry. I R was initially like this. I T G was like this. Now I R has decreased in reverse bias, whereas I T G is just the same. When ITG is just the same, ITG will flow in this direction, but that should be a really small current. So if I were to plot on one axis the voltage applied and the current through the diode, through this junction, ID, when the voltage is negative, which means that I'm reverse biasing, a small, an extremely small thermally generated current flows. And that does not change with the voltage. Because if I change the voltage, what's going to happen is that this is going to come further down. It's becoming more and more difficult for the recombination current, but the recombination current is very small anyway. But the thermally generated current is still taking place, and that only depends upon the temperature. That does not depend upon how far downhill you have to go. Once the electron hole synthesis has taken place, the electron can slope downhill. So in this region, a very small thermally generated current flows in the reverse bias. This could be of picoamperes to nanoamperes depending on the diode, depending on the manufacturer's specification. A small thermally generated current flows. Now what's going to happen in forward bias? If I do the inverse scenario and I forward bias this junction, P, N, negative, 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 positive, positive, positive. Now I connect a battery which has its terminals connected such that this is positive. This is the negative terminal of the battery. Remember I have negatively charged excess mobile electrons here, a sea of electrons here and I have poles here. So when positive charge accumulates here because of the battery, then this positive charge pushes the holes towards the junction. And the negative charge here pushes the sea of electrons towards the junction. So these holes would tend to jump in into this region. And these electrons would tend to jump into this region and they will dilute the effect of this junction capacitors. So this junction will actually shrink here by a few atomic scale units. So instead of a wide junction here, this junction is going to slightly shrink. So we have a smaller D now. We, when we have a smaller D, the potential difference is smaller. And if you compare the situation of the potential as compared to the, the equilibrium situation, U, E, X. This is what happens in uh, equilibrium. And now the situation is that this potential drop has decreased. Now what's going to happen is that negatively charged mobile charge carriers inside the n-type region will find it easier to gain sufficient energy K, they have sufficient energy K, they have to go uphill by a smaller amount K 
then they have to go down here, here and recombine with the holes. So this K is smaller than EG. So the electrons would now like to go uphill because they would know that once they enter the unwelcome region, which is the P-type material, they would recombine with holes and give off energy and lower the total energy of the system. Since this potential has gone up here, right? The potential has gone up here, and how much has it gone up? It has gone up, this potential energy has gone up by E times the voltage of the battery. This is by how much this potential has gone up. So now it's favorable for the majority charge carriers in the n-type region to go uphill by because they have sufficient kinetic energy. And in the process, when they come here, they recombine with holes and release energy. And the amount of energy they release is EG, the band gap energy. And that is larger than this K. So overall, the system is lowering its energy. So what's going to happen in this case, that these electrons that are flowing in this direction, they are the recombination current. This current goes up. Nothing is going to happen to ITG, but IR is going to go up. Right? When IR is going to go up, this means that the current in this direction is going to go up. If I increase this voltage even further, when I increase this voltage even further, this potential drop is going to rise here. So it becomes more and more favorable for the electrons to go uphill. Because the amount of energy they will release after recombination is still going to be the large band gap energy. So they will have to acquire smaller initial kinetic energies. And it's more probable that they have this initial kinetic energy because of the temperature, that they can go uphill slightly and then come downhill and lower the total energy of the system. And the probability, actually if you study statistical mechanics, is given by exponent of E V battery divided by KVT. So I increase this voltage slightly this probability of going uphill and lowering the energy increases tremendously, exponentially. That's why inside this region, I have an exponential rise in the current with an increase in the voltage. And this is called the forward bias region. That's why this PN junction is called a diode, because in the reverse bias, it conducts very little current, which is just the thermally generated current. In this region, nothing is going to happen to the thermally generated current. But that's very small. That's picoamperes or nanoamperes. And this current could be milliamps. It could be amps. It could be hundreds of amperes if you have a power diode. So what I've done, tried to do here, is to use band gap theory, the concept of holes and electrons. And in these two lectures, I've tried to come up with a holistic picture of how semiconductors work and how they can be put to use in a useful device. And I hope you will carry this message in your electrical engineering courses when you study circuits and devices. See you on Wednesday, on Thursday, inshallah.